dato non è più buono, lì mi manco parti, adesso si è confesso il braccio americano, ieri in Luca, e, well, uh, thank you for coming here, for, uh, for this uh, day about the uh, workshop or the end sequence, and, uh, well, I leave the floor, I introduce uh, Professor Pino Pietrini, who is the director of the Institute of Foral Advanced Studies in Luca, uh, for his uh, interviews. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone to this uh, afternoon, which is uh, dedicated to the important topic for uh, every scientist in the circle. I am very grateful to Professor Fudge and Marco for organizing this, this uh, symposium and to uh, the guest for agreeing to come here and share with us their experience. As Marco said, I am a newly appointed director of the IMT Institute of Advanced Studies in Luca, the place where you are now. And uh, it's a very great honor, for this reason, uh, my pleasure to be here and welcome you to this workshop on IRC grants for the excellence in European research. For those of you who may not know our institute, IMT is a public graduate school and a multidisciplinary research institute that focuses on the analysis of technological, economic, social, societal, and cultural systems. We have a PhD program which attracts students from around the world. This year we had uh, applications from 115 countries, over 2000, almost 2,000 applications. And our institute, despite its relatively young age, is in the 10th university foundation, uh, has uh, distinguished itself uh, around the world uh, thanks to the quality and innovativeness of its research and has gained an excellent reputation within the international scientific community and uh, within the Italian academic system. We are also very proud of a great number of European and national research projects that we are able to attract here in Luca. Since the beginning of 2015, IMT has started six new projects under the Horizon 2020 program for a total funding of 1.5 million euros. Our ongoing projects range from ICT to infrastructures from FIT proactive call on emerging teams and communities to very unique action. As I said before, uh, today we are here to focus on the ERC funded projects. The ERC is the first pan European funding body for frontier research and was set up in 2007 and operates according to a curiosity driven or bottom up approach which means that the program allows researchers to identify the opportunities in any field of research. The program is, aims to enhance the dynamic character, creativity, and excellence of European research at the frontiers of knowledge and through peer review competition, only the best researchers are found. The total budget allocated to ERC for the period 2014-2020 is 13.1 billion euros, which represents the 17% of the overall Horizon 2020 budget. So, with these premises on the amount of funding and the relevance of the ERC program for scientists in Europe, I think that this workshop will give us an overview of the opportunities offered by RC and will provide some useful practical information for scientists to follow, to apply, uh, for those who wish to apply, on how to write an RC proposal. It will also offer a broad spectrum of information and experiences derived from the successful stories of a principal investigator of four IRC projects affiliated to Tuscan universities. The projects range from political economy to the representation of literature through humanities, 
from engineering to the study of human brain and its complexity, highlighting the ability of the RC to support frontier research within the entire spectrum of knowledge and with special emphasis on innovative and interdisciplinary research methodologies. Multidisciplinarity and uh, integrated research is uh, the core system of uh, IMT. And therefore, we are particularly interested in uh, developing, encouraging, and uh, listening about uh, such research uh, projects that were successful by adopting this uh, innovation. I would like to conclude by thanking all the speakers who accepted our invitation and uh, are kindly here today with us. Marco Ferraro from the Agency for the Promotion of Indian Research, APRE, which is the RC national contact point in our country. Jennifer Mary Welsh from the European University Institute of Florence. Maria Concetta Monrone from the University of Pisa. Martina Urbagnac from the School of Management di Pisa. Last but not least, as I said at the beginning, I would like to sincerely thank Professor Marco Faggi and the staff the staff here of our research office for organizing such uh, interesting and uh, extremely important uh, event. And uh, with my best wishes for uh, the work of today, I'd like to put the podium to Professor Marco Ferrari. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming here. I'm uh, Marco Ferrano. I work for the Italian Agency for the Promotion of European Research. I am a national contact point for uh, Marismo Rosca Curie Actions and the European Research Council throughout the 21 uh, programs of uh, Horizon 2020, which is the European Commission funding program for research and innovation. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, I'm here for, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to be, to be here to present the opportunity offered by this program, the European Research Council. So, uh, I like very uh, interactive presentations. So, uh, yes, uh, if, at any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask, raise your hand, and we'll be glad to, to answer. So, uh, just um, the ERC is uh, a program of the European Commission, but it is not directly managed by the European Commission because it is uh, managed by an independent body of the European Research Council, which is formed by a scientific council and uh, uh, an executive agency. Of course, the scientific council deals with the scientific part of the program, so it's uh, responsible for the of the program, while the uh, executive agency deals with the communication and directly with the uh, management of the program and the goals of this program. So uh, basically, uh, which are the, the basics of this program, uh, the grants offered by the European Council are for the very best researcher, European but also non-European researcher. These are Codes program grants for single research. The philosophy of the ERC uh, is not for consortium or network of organization, but for the individual research. So the project must be presented by an individual researcher. Any nationality is eligible for the program, not just European researchers, at any age or uh, current place of work in. Uh, the, the moment. So it is not mandatory that the researcher is uh, as a contract at the time of the, uh, of the project, of the presentation of the project. So the main objective of the European Research Council.
capsule is to make Europe a, you can say, a research place more attractive for all the uh, scientists for all the time. And of course, the, one of the main objectives is to favor promote the brain drain and stop the brain uh, the brain drain. So to attract researcher and stop the you can say uh, all the, those researchers that for example uh, go to the United States or outside Europe. The uh, program is composed by three main uh, funding schemes, which are starting grant, consolidated grant, and advanced grant. And uh, the application depends on uh, the career, on the work experience of the researcher, and his or her scientific achievements at the moment of the presentation. Of course, uh, we have to be said that these are post grants for individual researchers, but this researcher that is uh, the present the, the project must create his or her team, research team. So the principal investigator, which is the aim that identify the researcher, can choose national, so from the, the state of his institution, but also transnational team members for his or her research team. And of course, the grant does not only cover the salary of the principal investigator, of the researcher, but also the grant of the team members. So, which, what kind of project does the ERC fund? All the field of fundamental research. Uh, the European Research Council is a bottom-up, as a bottom-up approach. So, any uh, thematic and in field of research is financed by the European Research Council. The researcher must not apply to a topic, must not respond to a call or a topic uh, established for, uh, by the European Commission, but it's free to choose the, the topic of his project. You can say uh, it is, you can say the, the projects are mainly uh, divided into three main area of research, which are, which are physical sciences and engineering, life sciences, and social sciences and humanities. But inside these three main areas, we have all uh, the scientific categories or uh, domain. It financed also high risk and high gain uh, project, so new area, new, new thematic. Uh, the project can last up to Five years, and as we said before, the philosophy of ERC project does not uh, foresee the creation of consortium or network of organization. One important uh, criteria is that the constitution of the researcher must be based in the in a EU countries or associated countries. Associated countries mainly are European countries that are not in the European Union. For example, Norway or uh, Switzerland and so on. But mainly the institution must be based into one of the 28 European Union countries. It can be the institution where the researcher already works or any other institution. There's no mobility group, like for example the Maritime Program. So the researcher is also free to choose the institution. Not just university, of course, but also research centers, SMEs, uh, foundation are eligible for an ERC project. So, as we say, the ERC has a bottom up approach. There are no priorities established by the European Research Council or by the European Commission. Of course, the program encourages interdisciplinary uh, projects. So which cross the boundaries between the, any uh, different fields of, of research. And these are the three main schemes we said before. So the first one is the starting grant. The uh, PI, the principal investigator eligible, has obtained uh, his PhD degree not more than seven years, a minimum two years. 
if he or she has at least one relevant independent publication without his or her PhD supervisor. And the minimum commitment to the project must be of the 50% of the working time. So these are the three eligibility criteria for a researcher who would like to apply to a starting grant. Then we have the consolidated grant. So that is seven, minimum seven up to 12 years post PhD. That's not anymore one relevant internet publication, but uh, the rules say several, but we always suggest at least five independent publications without the PhD supervisor. And the minimum commitment to the project must be at least 40% of the working time. The last one is the advanced grant. It's for established scientists. For this grant, the PhD is not mandatory. The researcher must have at least more than 10 years experience in research. So, a very advanced uh, curriculum, curriculum uh, dependent, of course, on the field of research. And the minimum commitment, it must be at least 30% of the working time. What, is, what are the objectives of the starting grant scheme? First of all, it's the general one of the European Research Council, so to support excellent research and excellent researchers, which are starting their independent career. So, and would like to create their team or their research program. The researcher <coughs> interested in to applying to a starting grant must demonstrate the groundbreaking nature of this project, the ambition, and of course, the feasibility. See now the, the size, the, the fund, the, the funding for the starting grant project. The maximum is 1.1 million, uh, 5,000 euros for five years. The starting grant project, project can have at least maximum of five years, uh, but we have seen also a lot of projects that last four or three years and half, four years or three years and half. It can be requested also additional. 500,000 euros of budget for two reasons. To cover startup costs, mainly for PI researchers to EU from outside EU. If the PI need to buy or purchase a major equipment, which is very important for the project. And uh, the last uh, possibility to ask additional budget is in the case uh, the researcher must access to large uh, research facility. So let's see now the profile, the, the CV of an uh, eligible uh, starting grant researcher. As we said before, the PI shall have been awarded their first PhD at least two and up to seven years prior to the 1st of January 2015. This was the date for the 2015 code. Of course, the same applies to this code, the 2016 code. Must have already shown the potential for research independence and maturity in research. Have produced at least one important publication without the PhD supervisor. Must be able to demonstrate a track record, a promising track record of early achievements. Of course, it must be a topic to the research field for the career stage. Significant publication, possibly as main author, and also uh, other achievement like uh, presentation, value presentation to international conference, participation to research project or research expedition. These are not all mandatory. The, the only criteria uh, which is mandatory is the publication. So, have at least one important publication without the presence of the PhD supervisor. Let's see now the profile of a consolidated grant scheme, funding scheme, and uh, research, eligible researcher. The objective is the same of the starting grant support excellent research and uh, excellent researchers. And of course, 
the PI resolution to which to apply it. So the little grants must demonstrate the groundbreaking nature, the ambition and the feasibility of the of this uh, uh, program. The budget here is up to a maximum of two million euros, always for five years maximum. But as uh, we, said, we saw before, the PI can ask for additional budget for the same two phases uh, of the study plan. So the budget can be uh, can be asked additional budget also for the consolidated grants. What is the profile of our eligible um, PI uh, in the consolidated grant? The shall have been awarded the first PhD over seven and up to twelve years, always prior to the first of January. 2016. Must have already shown research independence and evidence of maturity as it was starting. To have produced several, not just one, but several, at least five, I suggest, important publication without the PhD supervisor. Demonstrate a commensal track record of achievements in the area of research. Significant publication and, uh, as we said, we saw before, presentation, participation, conferences. Again, here is the same. These are not all mandatory uh, achievements, just the publication. Let's see now the last one, the last uh, main funding scheme of the European Research Council, which is the advanced grant. The objectives are the same of the starting and consolidator. Here can be awarded a maximum of 2,500,000 uh, euros euros for always for maximum five years and can be asked an additional one million euro for the same cases as the starting and consolidating. As I saw uh, as I said before, sorry, the PhD uh, is not mandatory for this funding scheme, but the researcher must be an active researcher of course and uh, must have a track record of uh, achievements in the last 10 years. 10 years, always from the 1st of January 2016. What is uh, asked, what the evaluators in ERC look for in an advanced CV? At least 10 publications as senior author in uh, international uh, peer review uh, journals and journals. Three major research monographs. One at least translated into other language. Another benchmarks for an advanced grant are at least five grant departments, ten invited presentations, three research expeditions, and three uh, established uh, international conference of participation at least three international conference as speaker or as organizer. Other benchmarks. Benchmarks for uh, contribution to launching the careers of researchers, for example, recognized leadership in industrial innovation, but as I say, these are not all mandatory. Let's have now, let's see now briefly some statistics on the starting grant and consolidated 2014 results, which was where the first goals of Horizon 2020, the, the new program. These are the, uh, divided by uh, states, by country of the host institution, so by the country of the institution chosen by the, the researcher. We can see Italy is a, a sixth place with 15 PI, uh, 15 grants in Italy, but 36 Italian researchers are to another country. So we can see a big difference. We, as researcher, we always have a great performance, but if we see the results uh, as host institution, we always have we have done a great performance. As you can see here, 15 in Italy and 36 outside Italy. These are the statistics for the consolidator, always 2014. And more or less the same. Uh, so we have 16 
AI in Italy, but 29 Italian researchers that did another job. These are uh, statistics about national and non national uh, researchers that obtained the, the grant. So you can see the difference between the nationals, the Italian researchers that has, have a project in Italy and the Italian researchers that decided to present a project and won a grant with a constitution of science in Italy. And we have just two uh, foreign researchers with a consolidated starting grant in Italy. We have 15 Italian researchers with a starting grant in Italy, but we have 13 Italian researchers that uh, moved to mainly UK, France, and Germany. These are the same statistics for the consolidator. Here we don't have any consolidated any foreign researcher with a consolidator in Italy. We have 16 Italian uh, consolidators, but 13 uh, that moved to outside Italy. As in this time, many United Kingdom or France. We can move to the other part. Do you have any questions about statistics or the eligibility criteria? Or we can move to the other part. So I have a question from the real world in international evaluation. I remember it was, it was uh, last year, I think that. Question, uh, question by the um, Were you motivated by the, the fact that there is such a kind of uh, uh, people who contributed to other countries from Italy? And they really asked the uh, opinion why it was a list of uh, questions, why actually the research is in Italy, why you would like to move to the UK, what other reasons? Do you know the outcome? I don't know the outcome of that survey, but we, I know the, the main reasons. Always mainly are connected to the, the salary or the, the best opportunities offered by the, the foreign the foreign institution. So mainly these are the, the reasons that for a Italian researcher to choose another institution. Also, the non infrastructures or uh, all these more or less reasons. Suggest not to include many senior professors. Of course, avoid to include the your PhD supervisor, for example, is a very bad uh, practice. But of course, if you if you think it's uh, necessary to have one, one senior professor because he's one of the main experts in his field, is one of the few researchers that can help you to, to, to that, that, that particular activities, you can of course. Including in the New York team. Yes. Uh, the main uh, obligation, I say, is not to have the PhD supervisor. So is Your PhD
Yes, this is all right. For example, the one which are connected to your research project, of course. But if you have a lot of publications which are which has have a lot of citations, even if there is the PhD supervisor, you can you can uh, yeah, it be yes, it might be better to to insert other publication before then you can you can also uh, present those publications with the PhD supervisor. Five, yes, maximum up to five yes publication. Of course you can say I have a uh, 60 publication with this it's with this uh, rating with this uh, citation but these are the only five the, the most important five yes of course because we have the cp later now we'll see how it's structured we have the cp but also the top level in the cp uh, you can in the top level you can be more detailed so you can more explanation Several publication. Sorry for the voice, but I have flu. So, did you mention that uh, the, the CP and for for the first time when I started the CP and the important publication? Uh, who defines important? Yes. It always depends on the, the field of research, but the evaluators are the, of your field, so they know how to define a scientific journal important. Or, but as I said, that's, uh, the most important criteria is the independent publication. Is the most important criteria. So just focus on that. But, uh, the most important thing that must come from your CV or your record is your independence. That's uh, not the not mainly the, the kind of journal where they published or this. Must the independence is the you have to focus on that. So present all your results that show your your independence. Any other question? Move to the second part. Uh, let's see now the structure. How we, some uh, some suggestion on how to present an ERC project. This is before at any time. Ask me questions. So, what is the content of the of the project of the application? You have three separate components, which are prepared. You can find it on the. European Commission Participant Portal, which from this system the submission starts. You don't have to present any uh, paper document, it's all online, it's an online submission system, so you can submit anything, it's nothing on paper or on the internet, on, uh, on this submission system. We'll have three main uh, parts, three main forms, the administrative submission form, the part A, the research proposal, which is formed by part B1 and part B2, and supporting documentation. The first form is the administrative, which is composed by five sections. General information on the project, like the acronym, a small abstract of the project. Of course, as it is an administrative form, here you have the administrative data of the organization or organizations, the budget, information on the budget that you are asking for your project, an ethics uh, question, an ethics survey, and some call specific question. The part B is composed by part B1, which is divided into four sections, the cover page of course, an extended synopsis of your project, which has a maximum of five pages, your CV, maximum two pages, and track record, maximum two pages. Ten-year track record is just for the advanced level. 
Then you have the part B2, which is the full scientific proposal, a maximum of 15 pages, which are divided into three sections state of the art objectives, methodology, and resources, both financial but also resources concerning the, the team building. The supporting implementation are the post institution level of support, which is mandatory. The, of course, the scanned copy of the PhD and other supporting documents, for example, for ethical or you know, maternity leave or any career break. These are the main documents of your project, of your application. Let's see now the, the part B. Of course, you have templates and you strictly have to adhere to these, uh, these templates. And of course, you have to keep the page. Uh, limits for each section of the project. These are some format information. So uh, on the font, on the format, where you you can find it also on the on the guidelines. How it is uh, composed? How it is uh, your application process? It is a single stage application, but the evaluation will be into two stages. You have also an interview for starting and consolidating grants, but not for the advancement. As I said before, all applications are online, nothing on paper. Here you find the link, uh, the participant portal, from where you will, uh, you will start your, your proposal. Of course, the main class is to regi register as soon as possible if you would like to apply, to complete soon the administrative form. And of course, download all the, the Part B, the guidelines, and so on. So some hints and tips about the, the first part of the project, the B1. Of course, as I said, it is important to underline the complete nature of your project. Uh, so this actual state of the art is not enough. Your project must, uh, let's say, go. Uh, go on the actual state of the art of your research team. Of course, it's important also to know who are your competitors, who are the other researchers uh, that maybe obtain also an ERC or would like to apply now uh, for an ERC. So what is the state of play and why is your idea outstanding is better than the idea of your competitors. At step one, as I said before, we have, we have only one stage submission, but two stage, uh, two steps uh, evaluation. At the first step of the evaluation, only the part B1, so the shorter part of your project, will be evaluated. So it is very important uh, because the B1 is the first impression that your, the evaluators will have about your idea. So present a consistent, clear uh, ideas, a clear presentation. And be careful because the evaluators are not always full experts in your field. In the part B1, it's important also to outline your methodology and, of course, to show the feasibility of your project. Show your scientific independence in the CV. And, of course, avoid any suspicion of plagiarism. Some hints and tips about the, the CV and your record. As I said, it's important to demonstrate leadership and independence. So give an example about you know, student, student supervision history. So where are the students supervised now? At which stage of their career are? Uh, their achievements that obtain thanks to your supervision. Show your experience in leading research collaborations at national or international level, as I said. Underline uh, interdisciplinary elements of your proposal and of your CV, of course, it's very important. And illustrate how you will be the team leader of the, and how you will coordinate the activities. Of course, you need to provide evidence uh, of excellence, so give a lot of facts on a few recent awards, uh, on your papers, publication, uh, if you had any input on uh, academia or industry. Uh, it's important also to use uh, bibliographic query tools to, to help you find statistics about uh, your activities, your publication. 
here it is uh, an example. So I am a Manipuri fellow, which is okay, it's, it's an important uh, achievement, but uh, it is better maybe to present this achievement in this way. So I'm the youngest European Manipuri fellow in the field of, or maybe another uh, example. I have uh, 700 citations in this publication. It's a great number, but maybe it would be better to present it in this way. Most cited paper on the subject on it uh, since 1999. Of course, in your CV and your record, avoid any claim that cannot be independently verified. Okay. Uh, the proposal will be evaluated in uh, two uh, criteria 50% of the evaluation will be on your CV. Your career and 50% of the evaluation, the other 50% will be on your on the idea of your career project. These are some uh, specific uh, tips on uh, it's a tips on uh, starting a consolidator. Here it's very important to demonstrate your independence as I said. Uh, also at the uh, in the in the project at the tip that you want to do, but also at the interview. So describe your if, if you have international experience, how it has helped uh, and improved your career. Explain how the, the grant will enhance your career, your independent career, and how your plans align to the goals of the ERC program. These are other examples of bad practice and good practice. This concerns always your CV. <coughs> Let's see now the, the second part of your project, the part B2. This part will be evaluated if you pass the first step of the evaluation. At the first step, the evaluators will read only the part B1. The, the length of the part B2 is 15 pages, not, uh, not more than 15. This is composed by the state of the art objectives, the methodology, and the resources. So, we suggest always to, uh, to have four pages for the state of the art, two pages for the progress beyond the state of the art of your project, eight pages for methodology, and one for the resources. The mandatory length is the 15 pages. This is the, the last one is just a, our suggestion on how to divide your part two. Concerning the first paragraph, the first part of the B2, the set of the art and objectives, remember this should be because you are doing project, so uh, underline and consider what excites you about uh, your project. Of course, always underline the groundbreaking nature of the project and maybe your research. Explain how your project will open new uh, opportunities in your field. And of course, it is important to, uh, when you're writing, to uh, keep the evaluation checklist. And I, I, I left the, the link where you can find it. So it is the checklist that the evaluators will use to evaluate your project. So you will find some questions uh, to which the evaluators will have to ask. <coughs> about your project. These are the team questions. So, to what extent does your proposed research address important challenges? To what extent are your objectives ambitious and beyond the state of the art? And how much is the proposed research high risk high gain? So, based on these two questions, the evaluator will evaluate your project. Let's see now the methodology, some suggestions. Of course, provide a clear uh, understandable uh, work plan, giving the details of intermediate goals, explain the role of each of your team members, so uh, explain why you choose uh, these team members, why you need two postdoc or one senior researcher, highlight any intermediate stage where you need an adjust of uh, project planning, this is very important for the feasibility as it is important for the feasibility to show the feasibility of your project, to provide a risk assessment for a plan B. Explain also how you will manage the project, remember you are the team leader. All the research parts and also the financial part of the project is 
in the end of the, the researcher, which is the only responsible for the project or the activities. Research activities, but also the uh, financial part of the project. Of course, uh, to make the proposal readable, it's important to include diagrams, uh, tables, uh, figures, uh, get chart also to illustrate the, the schedule of the project, but also, of course, uh, after that. Remember always the PRC evaluation criteria, the three questions that uh, will evaluate. The last part uh, the, is the part dedicated to the resources we are asking for, financial resources, but also uh, team uh, resources concerning your team and equip, equipment or uh, I don't know, infrastructure. You will find a cost table, which is this one. In this, uh, in this part of the B2, you will find this table, you will have to fill, but it's not. Uh, you don't have just to fill this table, but also give explanation. Explanation, for example, on uh, uh, the eligible cost. So, uh, cost for personnel, so explain why you need uh, three postdocs, uh, which are the salaries. Explanation on uh, any consumable you have to, to, to buy, any equipment. If you will have to travel for, uh, so you have to explain the reason. It is important to include also cost for publication of your uh, research results, cost for open access, which is mandatory for the PRC project. As I said, in the open access, so don't forget to include cost for, for this part. We have uh, three main cost categories in the ERC. We have direct eligible cost which are those costs that support the research activities of the project, the management, the training and dissemination activities. We have the indirect eligible costs, which are, cannot be directly linked uh, to the project, but incurred in direct uh, relationship with the project eligible costs. And then we have non-eligible costs, so costs that cannot be funded by the ERC. These are some examples of Direct eligible cost, of course, personal cost, so the salary of the PI, and the salary, so the salary of your team members, cost for subcontracting activities, contracting, travel cost, uh, related subsistence allowances, cost for other goods and services, for example, if you have to buy consumables, uh, dissemination and publication costs. <coughs> And then uh, direct costing for large research infrastructure, if you need to have access to a large research infrastructure. These are some examples of indirect eligible costs. So, uh, the general administration of the project and management, cost of office for uh, operating spaces, for rent of buildings, and so on, cost of maintenance of the laboratory. This is the so in this part, as I said, remember not just to fill the table, but also to explain at least the most important uh, cost categories. So for me it's all. So if you need any uh, clarification, or if you, for further information, you can find my, my contact, our contact. So uh, it's me and two colleagues. Uh, we are all in the National Contact Point for the European Research Council. So for any doubt, please don't hesitate to, to write and we'll be very glad to, to answer to any team if you would like to, to wish to, to apply to my ERC funding. Do you have any question now? Let's thank you for all the... Sorry again for, for the voice. Let me emphasize really one point of the nice talk. Um, well, the fact that is, uh, say, the, the application is uh, basically the proposal separated from part B1 and B2. B2, well, it, it's, uh, it's an issue. In fact, uh, in the first stage, only B1 are seen by the other panel members. So, 
basically uh, this five pages synopsis is essential. Sometimes you, you usually actually you devote a lot of time to analyze your the proposal or what we do, but this is not seen at the first stage. So when you come to the synopsis, you are almost at the time, and then maybe you, you, you provide this uh, in uh, this day, a quick way. Actually, try to do your best to have a good synopsis because this is the first uh, task. In, uh, one common mistake is to start with the V2 and then resume the V2 in the V1, which is a great mistake. So the first start. Let's consider that as two different projects, let's say. So first start with your V1 and then the focus on the V2. But never resume your V2 into the V1. So one other common mistake is that the V2 and V1 are, have a lot of parts of text that are the same. So they just copy and paste from the V2 to the V1. Yeah, those five pages are extremely important. And uh, of course also uh, your CV markers, uh, as I said. Very, very important and show this ability uh, um, and to, to independence because in the end uh, this uh, big client is helping you to achieve this transition to independence. So uh, you need to, to show that uh, you are able to do that. Um, in the end, uh, there's also a nice question regarding uh, which kind of publications I should, uh, I should add to, to, to this. Well, um, well, they like it uh, as far as I understood uh, from my speakers. Uh, they like to show that you, you try to face a new problem uh, based on your uh, practices. So, you should show that you are able to do that, but you are not already done this. So, uh, it's something that is new for you, that you have the right competencies to achieve that task. I think probably this is the, the way to, to emphasize this also through your previous publications. Somehow, you show that you have the skills able to face a new problem, not just a simple continuation of your standard research, something more ambitious. There are questions from uh, the audience? I think that uh, the most important thing is to, to focus on uh, the future, not on, uh, on the past. <coughs> so, uh, focus on the idea of the new, new idea of the project that you are presenting at the moment. So, uh, yes, of course. Yes, yes, it is very important. Pick a bit and, uh, yes, and uh, the feasibility, of course, of the, of the project. Yes. Oh, that, yes. In, yes, of course. There is also another <coughs> funding scheme, which is the proof of concept, which is, I think, also mainly for the applicability of the idea, the, the, the passage to research, from research to market. But uh, yes, and of course, the applicability is important. Uh, it's important also for the RC. We didn't, we didn't cover the proof of concept scheme because it's only for people that have already received the year sequence. For those that have a year sequence, um, except those they have last year, they must have to uh, more. Uh, once. Uh, so uh, sometime before the end of the project, they can apply to this proof of concept, which is really to realize prototypes something that uh, emerged from uh, the ERC ideas, but it must be based on uh, the ERC uh, project you have. That's why we didn't mention it. Uh, it's a smaller project, uh, 150,000 euro for creating prototypes to show the feasibility of your idea.
Dank je wel. Dank je wel. Dank je wel. In that relation. Yeah, the, yeah, the relation between the, your uh, the, the most important thing is that it's a new idea. So, your project. Uh, something that maybe you have not uh, already uh, worked a lot on. So, that's something you want to experiment, something new. So, uh, yes, you can, of course. Um, insert some application related to, to your project idea but uh, mainly focus uh, on other kind of publication so which are not directly related to the, the project idea the project idea must be something new something that you would like to work for the in the future but mainly that uh, is not always related to your previous works, your previous publications, or your previous project, if you work in other research project. The main uh, focus must be on independence. So your publication must show that you have already a uh, certain independence. You have obtained uh, independence and uh, Citation also very important, but mainly is independence. The main, you can say, criteria that will evaluate it, will be evaluated in your CV and track record. There are no other questions. Then we will conclude the interview to the next uh, next part, second part of the, uh, the workshop. When the idea was to put together. Uh, some successful uh, stories of the invisible investigators. We will have uh, three talks uh, related to advanced points, and then the last one uh, will be on starting points. Uh, basically, we have to put together also uh, different disciplines. So instead of having just a thematic, uh, say, uh, search area, since the uh, scheme is supporting any kind of uh, research, any in this script, we selected something that is uh, of course of interest for our institute. Um, as you know, we have uh, yet different facts, uh, economics, uh, and cultural heritage, and industrial analysis, also, agricultural heritage, and also uh, system engineering. So we decided to invite different people from different backgrounds to show you that actually uh, this kind of scheme is supporting any uh, innovative idea. So we'll start with uh, uh, basically Professor Jennifer. Uh, she is a principal investigator of uh, the NIRC Advanced Employment Project. Uh, the title is uh, uh, the Individualization of Work, uh, Reviewing the Ethics, Law, and Politics of Harvard. some hints about why um, I think the, the project uh, proposal was successful and how we organized it. I would just say as a, as a preface, while I'm the principal investigator on this round, um, it was very much a collective effort on the part of two other senior researchers in the other two disciplines, which I'll describe in, in a moment. And I think one of the, the challenges of applying for an ERC in a context where uh, interdisciplinary work is uh, is being promoted is actually to decide what who should be the PI uh, and uh, thinking about the balance of, of work. Um, so I'll say a, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as we go through. So, uh, what we're doing in the project 
projects in visualization four is analyzing the impact of what we observe as the increased prominence of the individual rather than the sovereign state in the theory and practice of armed conflict. So we start from the context that we observe, which is that there are powerful normative developments and technological developments which have promoted the increased prominence of the individual. And we thought long and hard about whether we should actually analyze these developments as part of the project. But then because of the future orientation of ERC grants, we decided instead, let's start from assuming that there are these developments related to individual human rights, related to more precise technological capabilities for targeting individuals, for example, effectively waging war. And let's instead ask, looking forward, uh, what are their, what is the impact of these developments likely to be? So we don't spend time in the project analyzing where individualization comes from. We instead look ahead to what we think its impact is going to be. And our puzzle or observation that starts uh, the project is that we see individualization creating very concrete dilemmas faced by policymakers. So we had in the upfront section of the proposal three or four illustrations of those dilemmas. One dilemma, just to give you an example, was uh, the dilemma in contemporary peacekeeping, where peacekeeping used to be a practice whereby military forces would stand in between warring parties, observe ceasefires, and essentially keep a peace that has already been generated. But what we see in contemporary peacekeeping is that uh, peacekeepers wearing blue helmets are instead being asked to enforce individual human rights violations. <coughs> They're actually being asked to protect individual civilians. Now this creates a massive dilemma because peacekeeping is founded on the principle of impartiality. Peacekeepers are impartial. But yet, as you, as you listen to my description, if you are actually punishing human rights violations, you are sometimes, for example, in the current context of the Democratic Republic of Congo, you're actually criticizing the government, which is cons consented to the presence of peacekeepers. So we had three or four of these dilemmas that we upfronted in the proposal, and we designed the project around how do we understand why these dilemmas arise, and how do we go about resolving them. So the framework for individualization that is really the framing of the project is that the individualization of conflict forces us to confront individuals in three different capacities. So one which relates to my vignette of a moment ago are individuals or civilians in need of protection. So that's one stream of the research is about civilian protection. The other, for those of you who, who follow the um, current debate on drones and targeted killing. The other is to think about individuals as being liable to attack because of their responsibility for threats to others. So very briefly, I'll tell you why this is so significant. Uh, the law of armed conflict, which was a 20th century development, thought about conflict participants in two groups, combatants or non-combatants. But what recent developments have done is really blow that distinction apart and begin to say, for example, certain combatants, because they don't pose a threat, shouldn't be liable to attack. Or on the other hand, certain non-combatants, because of the, the threat that they pose, should be liable to attack. And this is a very significant change in how we think about the law and ethics of war. So that's the second category. And lastly, probably the one that is most familiar to you, we think about individuals as agents who can be held accountable for the perpetration of crimes. So, for example, uh, if we take the Cambodian war crimes tribunals, uh, or tribunals that are currently ongoing for the genocide in the 1970s, you may say, how can you only try three individuals for a genocide that killed hundreds of thousands, millions of people? But what we see is the individualization of responsibility. So basically, the project is about these three kinds of individualization, protection, liability, and uh, accountability. And we have three different streams of research along each of those. 
And we have two background assumptions. And I, I won't go through these here, but I think for a proposal, it's very, very important because you can't write everything to be very upfront about the assumptions that you're working on. To state those certainly in your five page summary, uh, but also very clearly. And ours were really around two big themes. One was that individualization was creating dilemmas between individual human rights, individual liability, and state sovereignty. And secondly, that individualization is contested. We, we take, I'll say this in a moment, we take a, a critical view. We don't assume that individualization is an unmitigated good. We instead <coughs> cause it and assess its impact. So what we're doing in the project, and I think maybe this is one reason why it was successful, I have to kind of blow my own profit here, is we were doing really three kinds of academic work in the proposal. First of all, we were doing very rich explaining. So how and why have these dilemmas of individualization arisen? And we're, we're using um, case study research for this. In some cases, very difficult field work. So we are now 18 months into the grant, and we've had uh, field research in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in South Sudan, which has been actually very difficult uh, to organize. But in order to have a rich explanation as opposed to a superficial one, we had to do that kind of primary research. Secondly, we're doing theory building. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And then lastly, we're also doing policy recommendations for three kinds of actors, for national governments, for international organizations like the UN, and for humanitarian uh, organization, say the children, ICRC, etc. So we essentially tailored our policy recommendations at the key actors in our conflict today. Uh, methodology, uh, actually, our methodology section was a bit shorter than what you said, but it was the hardest part of the proposal, partly because, uh, and I think this is common for all ERC grants, you're being encouraged to be interdisciplinary. So it's very difficult to talk in a coherent way about your methodology. Uh, because what our project brings together is international relations, moral philosophy, and law. Uh, and it, those are three disciplines that are very distinct. And so trying to capture your methodology is quite hard. But we focused on five different features, and so uh, we structured the discussion around these five features. Our critical approach, and this I think was also part of the risk um, feature of the grant, that we were taking a more critical approach. Interdisciplinarity, which I think is risky in and of itself. We were lucky in this proposal in that the lawyer and moral philosopher and political scientist, I'm the, the latter, we had worked together before. Uh, and I think had we not, we would be much less further along than we are now. Because I think in interdisciplinary work, it can take you two to three years just to know what each other is talking about. Uh, and we had, a, we had a base from which to work, uh, which I think was important. We also, as I mentioned, were using heuristic case studies, um, a pragmatist epistemology, and what I mean by that is it is a toggling back and forth between theory and practice. So our moral philosopher is a very well-known uh, just war theorist, revisionist moral philosopher. But his ideas, his theories, really need to be road tested, you could say. Uh, and then lastly, a link between global and local. And in the interest of time, I, I won't explain that further, but I can, I can elaborate. Um, we have three research streams around those three uh, individual manifestations, so around protection, around liability, and around accountability. We have a senior researcher as the lead in each of those streams. And in two of those streams, the senior researcher is allocating 50% of his or her time. As, a, as PI, I'm giving 50% uh, of my time. And then we have three postdoc researchers uh, who are full time. We also have, I'll just jump down, something we built into the proposal, which I might recommend to some of you, 
is something which we call visiting experts or visiting fellows, in that it was too difficult to think about certain individuals as, uh, as either res named researchers or as um, part of a beneficiary institution. So instead, we budgeted a certain lump sum that we would bring them to one of the three locations for a six-week to eight-week period when they could interact with the team physically and then be on a more ad hoc basis interacting with us. We have five teams on our project. So it was a way of bringing in distinguished people, in some cases they were more junior, uh, to be part of the project but not as named researchers. We have a, a one administrative support uh, person who is at the EUI. We have a central website, we have a blog, uh, we have uh, places for sharing information. And because we are in three or four different locations, so the, the bulk of the grant is at the EUI, but there uh, is a significant portion at Oxford and there is one researcher in New York. So we do monthly virtual meetings. And then we, this is something which isn't in the proposal, but that we developed in the first year, is we meet uh, twice a year, all of us in person. And we've done that uh, twice now, and we're just coming up to our third. And what we've also experimented is we bring uh, someone to each of those team meetings who is a scholar in this area, but who we haven't involved in the project. And we ask them just to sit with us for a day and comment on the ideas being generated. Uh, so actually, at the first one, we invited someone who had written an article after the proposal was submitted called The Individualization of War, <laughs> which made us very worried uh, because we thought, here's someone who's written something exactly on our topic. Uh, but rather than be afraid of it, we actually brought her for a day to Florence and she sat with the project. It's not expensive to do, but I think it's a very, very interesting way of bringing in expertise. And then lastly, we have regular events and workshops involving policymakers. That's because of the nature of, of what we're doing. Um, but I would uh, also, in terms of impact, which I think is important for how we score it is, um, is useful. I would just say two things in conclusion. Um, one is that I think it is important to, at least it was in my case, uh, to work against your better instincts to be modest and to really say how pathbreaking what you're doing is. Uh, even if you doubt how pathbreaking it is yourself, but you really have to send that message and provide evidence. For that. Um, secondly, sorry, I have three things. Secondly, when you're thinking about your own CV, although you have very um, limited space, try and be, um, try and, and show diversity. So, for example, you want the publications, but you also want to show, particularly for advanced grants, that you've been an important force in the development of other scholars. Um, and that was a, a case for me because I'd been in an institution where there was lots of PhD supervision. So I could talk about the number of PhDs I'd supervised and where they all were. And I did that in a very concise paragraph, but I think it was important. Also, I was very transparent um, about the fact that I had had two um, maternity leaves during my tenure in track record, and I simply said, you know, that's what happened, and so that's why my CV is, is what it is. And I guess my last point is more a uh, very particular experience which might be relevant to some of you. It's our colleague here, um, Marco, mentioned that uh, you can move a U.S. grad, you can move the PI. My experience is that was extremely difficult. Now, it may be anecdotal, um, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say don't do it, but be prepared for how difficult it is. It's not difficult from the ERC. The ERC makes it very easy. It's difficult from the institutions in front. And the hardest part of my ERC grant was moving, not to say too much, moving in from Oxford where it was awarded, because I was in Oxford at the time, to the EUI and working out an arrangement. 
Uh, and that's partly because these grounds are seen as very prestigious by these institutions. The great news is that the ERC makes it very easy. They are, they are very flexible. They want to support you as an individual researcher. But just be aware of, uh, if you are thinking about moving, how you have to manage the diplomacy of that. Uh, and that's all I would, uh, all I would say. I don't know if there's any questions now, or should we do all five? Anybody can ask questions if there's a uh, remote, uh, otherwise it's just going to be a few. Those are very good questions. So, um, I guess I'd say two things about the cases. Um, firstly, I think it's very important um, in any social science research to make very clear what the cases are doing. Because lots of people will mention case studies without clarifying what precisely <coughs> they're doing. Um, for us, they are heuristic because we don't, um, we don't have a large end. There isn't a huge sample of these cases compared to other phenomena in the social sciences. Uh, and the, we have to choose cases where these don't, we're choosing on our dependent variable in a sense. We were choosing on, we knew that these cases had raised the limits. And we, we made the argument for feasibility in terms of the particular people involved in the project because they had done extensive field work before. And we find ourselves now um, having actually over budgeted for field work because what happened is I budgeted for two people for each of the difficult cases because I wanted to show feasibility. Uh, but what we did instead was send one from the project team and then we used local people to answer your next question. So it actually made it less expensive. So right now I'm in the process of doing my first financial report um, and my field work uh, line item is lower than what was budgeted. Partly it's because we went for that structure. I'm now kind of wishing I'd done it at the beginning that way. Um, but we just didn't have, we had some mentioning of local institutions um, in the proposal itself. We talked, we, we talked, but we talked about it generally. We weren't very specific um, because we couldn't be in that. Uh, but I think I would err on the side of over budgeting a bit for field work to give yourself flexibility. Uh, but I will try and uh, promise that you will find local researchers and just make sure you do. Because I think it's actually a better way uh, to set it up. We also had, uh, every institution will have this, there's, a, there's an ethics committee. Uh, at the EUI, and we had to demonstrate um, not only that the kind of work we were doing wouldn't endanger our interviewees, um, but also that we were uh, taking reasonable risks. Um, we did have an incident with one of our researchers, so it just shows how important it is to make sure you have a well-documented um, Kind of risk analysis for anyone who's doing field work, and we just included all of that. They wanted that, and that was included as part of the proposal in the kind of uh, it's an annex. So the annex was an annex, but also we had to do a questionnaire about. Uh, we included a questionnaire about field work. We also set up. I forgot to mention this: a small advisory board for the field work, which we call the ethics advisory board. Um, and we have used them, some people do it for the project as a whole. We did it more for one stream of the research that involved most of the field work. 
um, and we and they were from uh, organizations that are very active in the field, and so they've actually been incredibly helpful. So we did that as well. Thank you. Unfortunately, a lot of time, 
there is always a person that we find this time and don't do this and then do what you do. Okay, anyway, so as has been already said up to now, the research behind the proposal needs to be very extensive. Is it five years to 45 million? Cannot be one idea, one step, or one idea, or just one step. It requires a team behind it. It requires a strong team. Could be just one institution, could be a lot of institutions, could be just that one institution gets the money, like in my second grant, but usually with a lot of collaboration. In my grant, there are as three collaborators, there are all these institutions. They don't get money, but and as free collaborator, there is University of Oxford, University of Sydney, University of uh, the, um, <laughs> Frankfurt, and many others. So these are exchange visit, exchange student, but the team and the expertise has to be the, the search needs to be very rich, and you have to be recognized as a leader. Especially for the advance, they do so much for the uh, consolidator, or I don't have much experience for the starting of grant. So, when I did apply in 2012, these were my numbers. I mean, I had an H index of 46, and then again, so nearly 6,000 of citation, and then you have to put in context. I mean, you have to say what means 6,000 citation in your field. You don't have much space, so you have to say it very, very shortly, but it's important to say. Now, as I said before, the choice of the panel is crucial, really crucial. It's important information to know who are the panel. Usually it's very hard to know, but if you ask friends, you, you will know. And the panel rotates, so yes. they are never in the same year. So the one that were there last year surely will not be this year. So, but perhaps they know somebody that will be in. So if there are people that you know, please go and write that. They will tell you. Yeah. I mean, they are. And the last important thing you have to capitalize on I mean, the AI impact result. And important that is research. So your grant has to be new. But if you go and say great new idea, the referee will not believe it. So they say, oh yes, but they can really do this? It's too big, it's too great. So usually, at least this was my experience, when we started with this grant and I would go and illustrate it. What I had just published the year before an important paper was the start of a new field, of a new research, and I capitalized on that. I said, look, we are doing this, this is the start, and now I want to grow up around this. And this is uh, overall uh, uh, the, how complex is my grant. We have at least four independent teams, and beside this team of study, there are at least four independent, four group of people. So it's not a small operation. And the idea is all centered around uh, visual plasticity and how plastic is the human brain and the human perception. But that is not enough. Although, you know, it's an important, but it's not a breakthrough idea. What is really behind is how you do study that. And what is the, of the future for that? Well, we, we got the idea because we demonstrated that the plasticity that has told that was close after a critical period, at least for early visual processing, is not so true. We demonstrated in that publication that there is a lot of plasticity in adult brain, and that is important because if you are an engineer, if you want to use a, a prosthetic uh, interface, you need plasticity of the brain. The brain needs to learn to use that prosthetic, so we need to understand plasticity. If you have an ictus and you want to regain function, you need to know the basic plasticity mechanism in adult, not during development. And, but that is not enough. We, you need two important new, something that is really new, as I said before, that really makes the difference. 
And for us, what was the new bit, the technological great advance it was the use of the 70 MRI. And since it was new, in this I we have one, but many, nearly all those that is not completely working, it's still not perfect. So I call it now Oxford SI 70 scanner. This is magnetic resonance ultra field. And I said, well, I will use uh, the Oxford, I will use PISA, I will try to make the lines in this. And this is one aspect. The other aspect it was really to do fMRI of newborn, human newborn. And this was one research again up to the edge of technology, away from the board. So indeed, the period of the 70s scanner in Oxford worked very well. We really have the one important publication now. And now we are hoping to use the, the, the PISA scanner and again, uh, as that has been, I think, an important asset to get the uh, award. Without that asset, probably I would not get because it really is up to the leading edge of the Technology in some field, in some analysis. So we hope to get uh, some results studying really the plasticity <coughs> at the level of half a millimeter so of the human brain that could be enabled at that millimeter. As I said, the other, the other aspect was to study infant. What they were awake in the, in the scanner, this is a four year, four week old infant, technically very difficult, no previous work at all, so it was a really a jump in the, you know, what is high risky. But while this aspect was high risky, and other aspect of the brain, that are all these other box, is solid, innovative, but solid and clearly highly productive. So somehow we have to balance both aspects. Because if you just go and say, well, I will do, I will discover, like, like I was in the review of a great consolidator program, it was a, a movie maker. So you said, wow, movie maker. He wanted to do the study, the impression of the movie maker, how to make the movie maker by recording fMRI in I mean, you cannot say this, but, you know, so you have to demonstrate that that research will work. So, this it was really jump in the hole, so I had to present preliminary data. And I did put, this is slide number two, this is the slide number one of my B1 part, so the synopsis. And this was with slide number two in the extensive part where there is also the methodology. And so it was important to present the preliminary data because so the referee could believe us that we could make it. That was not just a case of me. And again, it was not a case of the progress just the last few weeks ago. So overall, I think that uh, you need a well-balanced program that here uh, should be developed around in a non but even breakthrough idea, but most of the research should be solid and even some can be also incremental, despite that they say that everything has to be good. We have to think that who is reading this uh, grant are excellent scientists, the panel are all really top level scientists, but they feel like you. So they will be interested if you are interested. And uh, you have also to show that you have the authority and the competence to do that research, that they cannot just dismiss you, say, oh, they cannot do it. You have, I mean, all of us are review of a paper, of event, and so on. So you have to really to put yourself in the review side. Usually the review are five, so you, at least one will be me. The other four usually are yes, so you go to the second stage. That review will be read by panel. How many people in the panel? Uh, the panel 15. Two will be experts, obviously, 
times one and two, da 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 da. So here you have to make this exciting to them. So the B one should be really exciting. And also your CV, you have really to show a stress your strength without really, you know, it's with modesty. But really you have to show what is your strength and what you did really do to make an advance to the field. You have very little space. A common mistake that I found reviewing the many of this thread was that you repeat in V2 what you already said in V1. You don't need that. You need to start by V1, thinking B. And then you go in V2, starting from where you left V1, going in details of the state of the art. And you have to engage in the interest of the review, convince that you and your group can really do the research, convince that the research is important, solid, remember, solid. A lot of the panel are American, and if you don't demonstrate to them that it's solid, they will strike you out. You know, American really wants it. The details. And the problem is that you don't have any space for details. And that's what I like, I can say. Good luck. So, if there are any uh, questions on uh, this talk, on the methodology, on curiosity, how do you uh, practically uh, show that you have the access to facilities like San Tesla or Ecolution? Nothing. Ah. <laughs> I just say that I will have. If, you, you cannot add to the data intending the appendix, like you said at the end. No, no, you are right. I added the uh, letter from Oxford and I added the letter from the Imam Bastet. Yeah, showing that the collaboration is going on. There is also another aspect for our field that, as you know, is really difficult is the ethical stuff. Because if you don't show any ethical approval, they say, no, oh, well, that is not. So, but of course, you are not going to this heavy long process of having all ethical approval that takes. Six months. So what I did, I put the sum approval of some of the research, and then uh, I took more than seven months to clear up the ethical process. Other questions? Not uh, uh, thank you again, uh,
such form of hand in both vertical and typographic terms on the reception process leave the edge of printing. <coughs> As inquiry, murals the eyes learned interests, research interests, in visual studies, and draw from the wealth of consolidated GTL's experience in digital humanities. Since its foundation in 2001, it's been on <clears throat> Persica and Center for Digital Research and Cultural Heritage, established in the 1970s by Paolo Barocchi. The GPS directed in a setting, is oriented the activities of the research group towards the transdisciplinary analysis of war image relationships in various historical and literary contexts, and in particular towards the development of digital archives. By being strongly rooted on this corner of the eyes and GPS research experience, the years of the Vina Dorn project present several aspects that make it a strong continuous approach. First of all, the technological approach is highly innovative as it intersects the transdisciplinary perspective of literary analysis and the tradition of visual studies and theory of perception. Secondly, it presents an extreme internal period as the research issue and the digital technology supply are strongly integrated. The hypertextual construction field during the project joins the functions of navigation and construction knowledge, thus opening the paths of research and digital humanities. Finding its strong potential for resetting the model of this part of the future. For future projects, as the digital architecture that is being developed is open and flexible enough to be ethical. In other reception studies, which approach the classics from the visual tradition. But let us start from the very beginning, that is, from the state of art and the innovation that the Looking at Wars project offered. Until very recently, the Renaissance print book, the straight book, has been analyzed independently in its single components texts, images, or textual sets by scholars belonging to a number of fields, historians of literature. Historians and participants. The Looking at Forest project instead has brought to light the necessity of reconsidering the ancient book as a unitary object, a complex device capable of activating, the, activating dynamic relations between the single elements. Their interaction has been seen as a result of a number of cultural processes underlying the publication and at the same time as a powerful means for shaping the reader's understanding and memory of the book, thus becoming a medium capable of influencing the editorial and cultural life of the new. This strong transdisciplinary approach has been applied to a great classic of the Italian literature, and this key relevance for Leo's and its point in the Renaissance was another strong feature of the project. Indeed, the enormous success by a game by the Vicariosa Square since its first appearance in 1560. And the general affirmation of its final third version, published in 1332, profoundly affected the cultural life of the time. Curious popularity brought an overwhelming number of illustrated editions and led to an intense theoretical debate over the literary canon of the modernity. It also determined a renewed interest in the poems in even longer tradition, gave birth to a series of curiosos sequels and spin offs. And influence in both narrative and formal terms the vernacular translations of the ancient epic. At this point, the editorial success of Oriano's poem tightly intertwined with the editorial stories of works by other authors, such as Matteo Maria Boyati, Sorlano Inamorato, Vincenzo Infantino, Francesca Inamorata, and Ludovico Dolcis, as well as him. <coughs> the aim of the project is that. On the one hand, to better understand how the sophisticated printing format of Curiosos and Strange Editions actually contributed to its technology and facility for a model, tracing the logic of this typographic canonization of Curiosos as a modern classic, with the lovers on the other hand, to fully appreciate the ways in which the poem's editorial packaging has been then systematically used in the printing press. Indeed, frequently adopted both to give prestige to the contemporary epic production and to boost the editorial success of the classics of antiquity and medieval romance tradition. In facing this challenge, the research team has strictly followed the project set structure as defined in the project proposal. During the first 18 months of the project, 
project, the researchers basically engaged in three types of activities. The libraries change the defining the different corpus are to be collected in the digital archive. In the sample analysis of the number of editions and in the definition of the functionalities expected in the digital archive. The study point of this study has necessarily been the analysis of the process of editorial success and the study of the six Six, six and century editions of the time, and all end up with the original curative corpus. The theme, Jolie, Palazzur, Padris, Paris, and the Conscience. To begin our inquiry from this well defined and homogeneous group of editions, allowed us investigating the ways in which the stories of Ariosto's ancient thought were read, selected, and managed during their transcodification in the delivery. This was a refined to apply not only the selection criteria and their ideological premises, but also the possible alternations of the narrative substance and the subject meanings. In this way, the time's peculiar memory conveyed through the illustrations could be defined. It helps to better understand the variety of meanings underlying the reuse of the author's video concepts and the ideological purposes implied in the adoption of the sortorial as established in the project proposal, in parallel with the research, the research team has engaged in the study of the modeling functions of curiosity by the bibliographic faculty. This was done through a sample analysis of a variety of texts. Curiosity impact on the editorial format of works belonging to the ancient, medieval, and every modern language tradition has been studied through the figurative and paradoxical sets of works. Ludovico Dolce, Luigi Pucci, Matteo Maria, Matteo Maria Boiato, and others. Just to give you an example, the analysis of Danish Chancellor Floridoro by Michela Caponte has allowed exploring some aspects of Curiosity's canonizing influence on the 16th century second movie epic production. At the same time, for the study of the three editions of Jerusalem and Ibenaka, the research team has investigated the editorial impact of Aristotle's poem on the second great epic model of the Italian Chicken, the one of the Catholic Catastrophe. This broad reconnaissance survey has been necessary since right from the start of the project. The research team has engaged in designing of this paradigm. Indeed, the project's core, the project's core objective is the building of a hypertextual architecture that would be enabled to express the world image relations between various resources and support the study. To carry out, in parallel, the inquiry of the liberal and figurative sources on the design of the digital archive has been necessary as it helped adapt the hypertextual structure to the research requirements. In this way, the textualities of the digital hypertext were being defined as the scientific issues were emerging from the analysis of the editions, thus making the teacher of mine perfectly capable of reflecting. Once the design of the fundamental functionalities of the digital archive was finished, the research team has engaged in the second step of the project, that is the definition of that data structure and encoding tools, the development of the archive backend and then the data entry. In facing this challenge, the research team drew on a well consolidated experience. Indeed, right from the beginning of each of those activities, the transdisciplinary approach intertwined the analysis of contemporary texts with historical inquiry, research and book illustration, and uh, visual studies was associated with the development of open access digital archives. They were meant to represent hypertextual architectures in which not only to collect figurative and literal resources and to store data and metadata derived from this data, but also to make such resources available for full text and cross search. As such, they were exposed to both business and safer scientific acquisitions and to enhance user security requirements. This long term expertise in digital humanities has been crucial to the work on the Minas of the Book of Ancient Words project. Yet, as I mentioned, in the, the large number of religious <coughs> works and, the consequently, the great variety and complexity of their relations to the digital tool is expected to meet them. For making the building of this archive extremely challenging, it was clear that the hypertextual 
framework intended to enable scholars to study the modeling function of reality from the perspective of images and editorial content would have to be a drug of fashionable analysis going beyond the mark of the text and description of images. In particular, it appears vital to map and link the illustrations to each other to collect certain portions of images with textual and contextual fragments inspiring and commenting on them. And finally, to semantically describe the visual influences between such resources. These challenging aspects were moved into the research team to make the most of its past digital research experience and to go far beyond that. This is an example of the relations of the research team. Indeed, it was obvious that some of the digital tools that had been projected, developed, and tested in the previous research project carried out to the center would have to be altered. For instance, this is the case of the XML markup language for the use of the shared markup for textual resources in research and data. This textual markup adopted in a number of GPLs projects, such as the research in the first um, illustrated editions of Rios or the work on Adam and Chestodon, appeared not applicable to the development of the archive of the Burkina Faso project. The complexity of the analysis that we were carrying on this occasion would have led to overchanging the text with XML tags and would end up with making it legible. Moreover, numerous <coughs> activities that we were forced to add to the standard XML tags would have reduced the interoperability of our data. Clearly, all of them would have been in sharp contrast with WBC mission. And the critical issue of the project was to emphasize the simplicity, flexibility, and generality of this markup. Another problem is that XML was not useful in the digital coding of images. We could not map illustrations, and it was impossible to create links among various representations of the same textual problem. This led HTS researchers to developing and testing a number of highly customized satellite applications for the mapping of research resources. In particular, in the work of the Burkina Faso project, the research group encountered two polar scientific compositions. The last one, the first one, was the image mapping tool, a digital instrument offering the possibility to directly map between the curated resources the areas most closely implemented to the text. It had been developed between 2008 and 2012 within the ERC Starting Ground project, coordinated by the PI Giovanni Rizzarelli and dedicated to the literary work of a and a great version of this tool named Flexi, and based on the open source technology, was released a few months after the conclusion of the Tony project, during the building of the first collection dedicated to the tools. Thanks to this tool, the current sections of the images could be mapped and linked directly to the persons that had inspired them. It was a chief achievement of ideological relations between the iconic and the verbal code or find expressed in the back end solutions. <coughs> Yet, despite these important accomplishments, the research team was still forced to working on a number of separate applications that were making our job complex, time consuming, and highly, highly subjected to errors. As a result, when the research group engaged in the building of the Burkina Words project and archive, it appeared clear that the huge value of data and the variety and complexity of its relations, <coughs> as defined during the first step of the project, needed to be supported by a new backend technology. This had been achieved thanks to the reports for highly limited backend structure built on Symphony, an open source PHP web application framework released under the MIT license. Within this digital supporting grid, a number of specific software applications can be embedded, developed, optimized, and interconnected so as to fully reflect all the research issues introduced in the first phase of the inquiry and the archive design. The Symphony backend allows including the data, the metadata, and all the related entities directly into a unique, coherent, and user friendly mechanism. <coughs> And at the same time, it allows separate encoding of the right type of heterogeneous resources. As a result, textual sources are still encoded with XML. However, such markup is not used to express, sorry, is now used to express only structural and
and then semantic implementation. Thus, it does not need to be overcharged with the XML files anymore. The images are on with text, which allows to define the narrative content in various meaningful sections. The connection between the two entities are mediated by the critical dis descriptions provided by the symphony mechanism and are expressed according to the Tandem Crazy Resource Description Framework Specification. The data semantic annotation is done in Tandem. An open source semantic annotation with Tandem and those allows the research team to annotate the digital items in the collection using tables, each table being like a subject, there and object of a memory and sentence. In this way, the research team creates assertion that certain objects have properties with a certain value, putting their reality in relation, for instance, a single image portion and a textual fragment that have inspired for the entire textual content related to it. Moreover, the image sections contained in Tandy are enriched with data from vocabularies. The vocabularies and the Tandy number project define the concepts of character, place, object, and the number of things which we remain referenced in our illustration of anatomy, in our analysis of illustration. Such vocabularies are supported by common corpus semantic basket manager. This satellite application allows research groups to build its taxonomies that, although distinctive, are still based on those available from different providers of vocabularies used to describe the web resources. Furthermore, it also enables us to make these descriptions more exact, to introduce logical connections about among related concepts, and to specify inference rules. As a result, it exposes the vocabulary items and the semantic connection between the entities as linked to data to, the, to be accessed by third party applications. Thanks to that, an important part of the digital data storage they are finally semantically described and can be shared. This guarantees the data semantic interoperability and makes an important part of our data strongly compliant with the semantic web standards. The application of these new technologies allow the research team to be precise to reflect the multiple and complex dynamics which govern the world image relationship within the discrete group. The complexity of the research issues in our semantic and our scientific acquisitions can be thus faithfully rendered in a digital archive which does not seem to offer a broad and rendering of relationships between the different resources, but gives a structural and semantic representation of such relations. Organized in this way, the backend structure is able to fully express, also from the technological point of view, the scientific requirements of the project. For this reason, the development of such open, flexible, and interoperable Hypertextual architecture can already be considered in itself an important research achievement for the project. Moreover, such a structure can constitute a model for future projects aimed at analyzing the classes through their ideological transition. Last but not least, the data openness and interoperability renders our archive ready to be accessed and reused within the semantic web. In the near future, all of the archives back and information will be expressed in triple source, making all of the our data machine and understandable and available to others as linked and open data. This will make possible a precise semantic retrieval of our data and its easy integration to other digital archives and web applications. For instance, a future research team or research institution investigating the figurative tradition of the mental illness concept would be able to retrieve together with a number of representations taken from various centers, also a number of images and research data from our digital archive, and integrate them into our digital into its own digital collection.
the duty of the working hard of the um, technological development of our digital companies. So we're there just to um, describe the functionalities and to discuss with them the opportunities that the new digital tools were giving to us. We were posing problems and they were saying, yes, this is something that is good. <coughs> but the school offers us this. Do you think you may need this? So it's just continuous and constant exchange of competencies. But we define it quite well in just all of the, in the first in the proposal. And we described it with the research team exactly the same. People from Israel killed researchers in um, this art, art history, art departments.
So basically, as also what was said, uh, when you go to class excellence, uh, this code often have a certain thing, but potentially with high impact, so it's called high risk, high gain, and they open new projections for research. Then they need a sufficient mass and scope to address the disciplinary topics. So that's why they support you with 1.5 or 2 million or even more uh, euros to, to perform your research. Not just a few euros. And this is something uh, not common, so that's quite important the open level and um, where the police they don't understand why so much money. Well, if you need to do something really new, that's uh, that's it is urgent indeed. And then uh, there should should be let's say uh, an impact on business and society, as we said before, real impact. So the idea when I started uh, building my proposal was total tax. I'm uh, from structural mechanics. Uh, I'm an engineer working in usually my field people are being into engines. So anyway, um, but anyway, my discipline is very important. It can cover from the nanoscale to the uh, earthquake uh, scale, so the uh, scale of the, uh, of the planet. But basically, uh, the idea was to look at the uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaic issue with a different point of view. Um, so let's start from the physics of the solar cell. Usually you have this kind of sketch, this is called a PM junction. So silicon is a semiconductor material, and uh, you can produce electricity via the so-called photovoltaic. But then uh, there is something more. You have the silicon cell. This is, a, let's say, you deposit fingers on the top of it, and then these fingers uh, that collect the electricity, that produce electricity, you collect them to the bus bars. And these are the main uh, conductors. They are soldered on the solar cell. And then you create a string of solar cells connected to silicon. This is just a part of your module. Then you put these uh, inside the PV module, as you can see here. And this is a composite material, so it's a laminate. You have different layers. Tetra, aluminum, tetra, a polymer encapsulating the solar cells, then again the polymer and finally glass cover. This is a possibility, uh, one of the possible PV modules you can see in the market. Well, there are many applications from PV parts, this is called the PV parts, to building integrated photovoltaics. This open new perspectives. Uh, in fact, um, with the demand basically uh, local tailoring of your PV module uh, because it must fit the, the need, the environmental need of your country, of your place. And so, um, as also a structural hole, must sustain load and uh, so on and so forth, and uh, can have a very different uh, composition and the, um, design of the layer, as you can see at the end of this case. Okay. What is the main focus of the PV community? So what is the classic view? So the solar energy conversion efficiency. So in plenty of code, the solar energy conversion efficiency. This you see here in this plot from the National Research Energy Laboratory, the best research in uh, cell efficiencies. So you have cell efficiency here uh, plotted versus years. So in the last uh, 30 years, you see an increase of solar energy efficiency. So the ability of the solar cell to transform the solar energy into the electric energy. But if you look at the blue curves, they are referred to basically crystalline silicon cells, which we use in the market. Some other techniques are actually only available in the lab. They are not yet uh, possible to produce on a large scale because they are too expensive. Then you see that uh, this uh, slope is quite uh, flat. And you have about 25% of uh, uh, efficiency, it is very tough to increase this efficiency by uh, avoiding an increase also in the cost, in the production cost. So, let's have a look at another point of view, durability. In fact, if you look now, not from the point of view of a physicist, applied physicist, but from the point of view of an engineer, then you look at this uh, composite and structure that is placed in the environment, and these are just to be uh, durable, so must have a long life. And what you see, which is not well reported uh, in the literature, or there are some contributions, but not comprehensive, you see that you can have quarks. This is an example, this is a PV module that we tested in the lab, uh, by, with the naked eye it looks perfect, but when you look at the, the electroluminescence sense image, you see a lot of dark areas. These are electrically inactive areas, and you see a lot of quarks. So this is an issue, and how they evolve is also an issue. Then, the cohesion of the encapsulant. So this is related to the failure of the polymer. 
that leads to this kind of failure and then uh, most of diffusion. And in fact, more so is also an issue. You can uh, basically create these electrically inactive areas due to a chemical oxidation of the green line. Okay, so let me convince you uh, that uh, it's worth uh, supporting this project. As I, I did basically some years ago, um, two years and a half ago, when uh, I had to, to, to say an interview uh, the process, uh, I had the possibility to present one single slide, five minutes uh, long, so I have five minutes of time. Today I think they, they allow you also to use more than one slide, as far as uh, I understand. So there is no constraint on that. But anyway, you must be concise and show uh, why it's what uh, supported that project and convince the panel members. Then they will ask you a lot of questions, about 25 minutes of questions, and you have to, um, to convince them. But anyway, let me say, open issues. Standard accelerated aging tests, available in the research, provide only fast fail criteria, based on electrical output only. But they reproduce fail modes never observed in the field. So they are not really realistic. And uh, uh, indeed, for instance, number of quarks is not a criteria at all. Uh, nobody has to take this electroluminescence image after production. So, you can have a certain amount of parts, they are usually used by soldering, then transportation, installation, and you still you don't know the degradation of these parts. Then, lack of simulation tools for durability. So if you are a company, you don't predict anything. It's difficult also to compare uh, from the point of view of the end user. Then, uh, lack of guidelines for non-destructive monitoring in the field. This is also an issue because uh, you can use uh, thermal imaging, uh, electroluminescence, but well, which kind of info, uh, info you can get from these images, it's uh, an open level. So, okay, so we propose a range of innovative, innovative methods. First of all, move from the solar cell to the whole PV module laminate. So let's think about the whole PV module, not just uh, the solar cell, because uh, it's the laminate that is placed in the, in the real world. Multiphysics framework, which requires an interdisciplinary view. So usually people uh, working in this field are people from uh, the applied physics or uh, they are electrical engineers. So they look at the electric power output. But they don't look at the mechanical issues at all. So you need uh, a new point of view. And you also need to learn, of course, uh, what is the state of the art. Then you need new testing method, more uh, sophisticated, but more uh, that can tell you something on the lifetime. And you also need new design criteria for PV models to sensitive to cracking. So let's learn, let's understand the phenomena, and then let's move to a new generation of PV models. Impact on society, a more reliable expectation on lifetime of PV technologies, better quality control and rating of PV productions. And let me say, to convince you finally, if you have a reduction of degradation rate from 1% per year to 0.5% per year, so not that much, this is equivalent to an increase of the solar energy conversion efficiency from 25% to 27% percentage, which is quite a lot, because probably it's not feasible today. So, let's look at the reduction of the degradation rate. Let's improve the quality of our products, uh, which is analogous in terms of, uh, basically, uh, the amount of energy produced to increase in the conversion energy efficiency, and also for the business price, it's also quite important. Okay. So this requires a lot of math. So it's not just a pure uh, observation. You need to put uh, everything in a multi-physics uh, uh, framework. So you have uh, partial differential equations. You have uh, uh, quite complex phenomena in multi-physics. At the center, you have nonlinear conduction. Okay. This is essential because uh, you have this kind of problem. Then this is providing the temperature to the other fields. Uh, in particular, it influences the nonlinear thermoelasticity mechanics because you are quarks and vice versa this is influencing the nonlinear conduction. Then you have an influence with the moisture diffusion. Well because the moisture is degrading the properties of your polymer and therefore is influencing the elastic field and vice versa. Fracture is also enhancing moisture diffusion. And finally all of these three uh, fields are influencing the semiconductor device equations. These are partial differential equations governing the physics of the solar so basically your electric response. So to look at the electric response, you have to look at the other things. Otherwise, you miss the 
for the past and today, up to now, nobody was able to, to do this. And then, uh, so this is the original uh, point of view that uh, it's a world in progress. Uh, we hope to achieve a final framework where we are able to, uh, to couple all these things together in a suitable computational framework. So then, uh, as you can see here, this is very challenging. In fact, you have very different length and time scales. The length scales are reported here. They are about six orders of magnitude uh, of range. Uh, the PV module is about one meter of size. Then you have the size of a single cell, some uh, centimeters, 10 centimeters, about 15 centimeters. You have then also the boundaries and so on. Then if you look at each uh, point, you have also the thickness, the so-called PH junction. And you have play boundary effects uh, and back effects uh, dominated at the, at the important at the micro uh, scale. On the other hand, you have different, uh, also, uh, sorry, uh, time scales. The combination effects are about one microsecond, then you move to winter fracture, uh, temperature cycles, about one day, up to most of the fusion. So the entire lifetime is 20, 20 years. So you would like to predict the response of this uh, uh, system. Then uh, this also uh, allowed us to perform uh, new ideas of multi physics testing, not just test purely the electric power, power output, um, which is also something new, and we, we, we built basically a new lab. So I moved this lab from Politecnico di Torino to Abdi Luca, um, and, but this opened also a new frontier of research far beyond the topics of this book, so also for technology transfer and many other things. Because it's really lab for research. And anyway, what we looked especially was the effect of the formation, so the mechanical field on the electric field. This is, you can see after bending, some part of the solar cell become dark, so you see there is a certain effect of the mechanical field on the electric response. So it's not enough to look at the PP module after production. And uh, well, we published a paper on the scientific report by nature on this, which is uh, important for us and a new topic. Then we are also looking at the uh, peeling of silicon thin films to produce new uh, solar cells via, let's say, um, thermoelastic effect. And uh, we can <coughs> analyze something inside the scanning electron microscope, and we can also perform tests inside the scanning electron microscope, which is one of the few facilities in Italy for this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Well, then after the project, so I didn't mention them during the proposal, but Luckily, it was a position sustained for many, uh, many people. And so uh, we received endorsement and collaborations from the International Energy Agency, uh, recently from the Joint Research Center. Honestly, this is actually a research project uh, common with IP Duke, and uh, we are copying from this, from this uh, framework. And they have a specific uh, center for uh, the characterization of the models. The Institute for Solar Energy Research in Amelie. And then also some companies, uh, they provide the material, they provide the free uh, material and the possibility to test uh, solar energy alternative. It's an Italian company producing flexible PV modules, applied materials, also Italia, and recently from the US, the big industrial and energy, they have a big production line of PV modules, about one gigabyte, gigabyte facility, uh, by the way, in Poland. And they are also collaborating with us. And finally, Certainly one uh, uh, important achievement should be at the end of the project to create a research group, a research team around me uh, to promote this transition to independence. And to be honest, up to now, uh, it was not easy to find uh, the, qualified, I mean, the best people we wanted, but so we were very selective. So the, the group is still small, although we have more money for investing in this kind of uh, collaborations and scholarships. This is the team here in Antiluca. All of them, I uh, have to say, are in committed. They are doing an excellent job. And thank you all of them. They are probably also here in the audience. And then some uh, visiting professors from other institutions, experts on different fields. Uh, Jose Reynoso is an expert in shells. Uh, Alessio Gizzi is an expert in uh, uh, biomedical object interaction, important for multiphysics. So, unbelievable, uh, different topic, but same mathematical method. And uh, also, Mauro uh, Corrado, who was my colleague at Torino, and now he's a very good fellow in uh, Lausanne, the Computer Winter at Lausanne, and Alice Bigoni, who's a 
which will investigate of uh, the mass grain, grain dog, and it's also collaborating uh, with us. Uh, I'm uh, really proud of this collaboration with young people really committed to, do, to this, uh, uh, this project and this uh, research. And so I acknowledge the assistant in grain. And uh, if you are interested in more details, you can have uh, you can download the midterm scientific report, which is published on the website of the research unit. Uh, it was a facet um, uh, uh, examination and uh, it was fine. And then also the annual report of the research unit uh, for accountability and for the general uh, transparency and so on. I really like to publish these results. Uh, in, uh, in our websites uh, uh, to, to show what we are doing uh, because we see my community uh, and we are also to uh, account for this. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 
I think even if my proposal was really not so much that disciplinary, I think that it's always appreciated. Also because uh, giving that the review independent comes from different backgrounds. You know, if you can need the interest of more people, it's better. So beside the, the technological aspect, because I mean, nowadays I mean, all the top scientists are is one project, one researcher, one institution. But uh, DRC uh, makes a lot of exceptions in this case. We saw a lot of projects with uh, other institutions in additional participants. There is not a limit, uh, but they must be very, very well justified in their participation. Uh, there is, a, you can say, a double justification concerning the institution coming from third countries. And a third um, justification uh, if this country is an industrialized country, like the United States. Because in other Horizon 2020 programs, these countries does not receive funds. They can participate, but on their own expenses. In ERC, uh, they are more flexible. Uh, so 
there are projects uh, in 2014, four projects with American vision and these ones were uh, funded. So they are seeing a complex. It's easier to, to have uh, American institutions or third countries institutions. The thing is that you have to really well justify in terms of scientific activities. Uh, you must well explain and uh, justify their added value for your project. So even this fact, you can include. There's not a limit. Yes, okay, uh, a paper, so just they have to, um, they must be involved in, uh, actively in the project, so they have to, and they have to this. Yes, yes, in your C, yes, they are more flexible than in other presentative programs, but remember always to justify and explain why, uh, what is their other value to your project, uh, their importance. Yeah. Uh, to, to, uh, because on 
can be a use of the contract with the organization of the exhibition. So we can have the of the exhibition and then the exhibition. So we need to have some sort of contract because it's related to this conference that we could not have. So we could have a bill and we could have a bill. So it's very good to find the money. Otherwise, some contract is not good. Um, was a 
not the remains um, of an eloquent particular matter, and uh, it's, it's famous for this uh, indignationality. I mean, there, there are books that are made of Paris and all the um, Gordon medieval flatteries and so Paris and Paris. So it, the digital archive is an excellent tool to describe the presence of various genres, the presence of various preterists, the presence of various um, improvements, you know, those uh, poetry, uh, new writings, and kind of stuff. So there was a strong, it became, there was a very strong coherence between the literary part of it and the digital part. Last point would say that uh, now <coughs> the collaboration with uh, Spanish companies such as Ian Philippe and Yasukuri is uh, the art company is an important aspect of an application of social production as well? Well, no. Uh, basically, uh, the center needed to have one single university in one part. Polytechnic was going on the time, and then I'm um, sure. No, actually, uh, I could have uh, purchased photos and so on from companies and then tested. It wasn't the plan. But anyway, when I asked the, uh, the company later on to, to provide me the material, I was quite happy to provide me later on the endorsement and send me the material for free. So that's why I acknowledge them. But they were not uh, listed uh, in, in the proposal. Uh, it's a, uh, I would say, positive outcome because there must be something. Uh, Useful for the society, other companies uh, in the end provide me the material they are interested in the research. With the one of these companies, we also called the in the paper. Uh, in the paper. I think that they were really interested in uh, providing uh, results and that was a uh, This was, was pretty nice for me. Uh, so, something that was purely small to and modern, modern in the network, it was super meta at that time now, then I think it will have been more. Especially with the company in the US, which is pretty nice. They learned, they, they read in my paper, and they contacted me. So I think I was astonished. Thank you. 
because in any case the panel is made of the core and the panel from different disciplines. So we need to convince all of them. This is my only test. And then the interview stage is very nice and a big experience because uh, you go there and uh, you have to you don't know exactly which place you are in the in the, in the ranking. So if you are really at the top or if you are in the case. Uh, those are really at the bottom are out, those in the middle are out. <laughs> it's a nice challenge, personally. Maybe just one practical thing. Uh, basically, to understand if it's the right time, right moment to, to apply for, for example, for a SACI grant. On the ERC website, you can find all the, the search here, funded uh, until 2014. So, in the search of the CV, you can understand. Yeah, I mean, uh, people, you know, ask if you have a going the list and if you find a, a project that is similar to what you, not to propose, but similar to, in the same field, you know, very close to your field. I mean, the people are very happy to send you their code. I mean, uh, it is not the industrial hat and on or anything like this. I mean, I usually send them my copy, I send them the zoom and, and they really get the credit, they really understand that at least I have to try. They usually think it's very successful. And also, I mean, the media reports are available to most different types, and you can go out to find a lot. Mine is online, many others are online. So, uh, and I also remember people that asked me Many things are together. I mean, to be deal, to be also supervision of business users, many things that they show that you are uh, tend to be independent. Of course, based on your base. I can just answer you on my personal point of view. Being a reviewer, usually you, you know, I see the really the paper that is independent or is not with your super. But to be another book in the world, usually you have to be first author, of course, you have the responsible of that book. But you can be so many authors there are, at least in my field, I mean, other fields it will be different. And usually I read this book right, to see really how much, you know, what really is the meaning or what is the importance of the paper. So I would say that has to be one paper that is mainly yours and one that is one of the most important. And if it's not the recent the one that is highly cited, respect to your field, of course. But it can be with anybody you want. I mean, it doesn't need to be simple. Yes, even this today.